And welcome to this ESIST podcast. My name's Richard Brownhill. I'm an improvement manager and nurse with ESIST, the Emergency Care Improvement Support Team. And it's my pleasure to introduce two colleagues today, Anthea and Caroline, who are going to talk to us about the professional nurse advocate. And um, I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves first, if you would, guys, and then we'll get on to talking about this really important thing you're going to tell us about. Hello, everyone. I'm Caroline Ogunshola. I am um, a professional development lead nurse at East London Foundation Trust in my job. But at, at the moment, I'm on a fellowship with um, the team, team CNO. So I'm one of the community nurse fellows working with Sam Sherrington to develop the community nursing plan. And it's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk to you about the professional nursing advocate. And I've got my colleague here, Antia Top. Antia. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm Anthea Thorpe. I'm an integrated service matron at Solent NHS Trust um, and also one of the community nurse fellows um, working with Caroline and Sam on developing the um, annual nursing programme. So and it is wonderful to be here and we're really excited to come and talk about our topic today. Thanks both very much. So uh, you're going to talk to us about the professional nurse advocate, which I I've heard things about and I've I've heard only very positive things about. But I wondered if you could tell us about what what is a professional nurse advocate and how and how how does one become one? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think what's really important for me to kind of to think about professional nurse advocates is obviously our chief nurse Ruth, uh, Ruth May, Dame Ruth May. Um, introduced this role back in March 2021. So obviously the backdrop is really important because we're coming out of the third wave of COVID. Um, you know, we're looking at a start of a critical point in her words as well for recovery, for patients, for services, and again, for the workforce, um, you know, of the NHS. And I think professional nurse advocacy sort of arrived at the right time, really, and it's highlighted you know, the need to support nurses with their mental health and well-being. And the PNA has been born out of that. And it's been sort of in place since March 2021. A version of the programme has already been running um, in the maternity field since 2017. But professional nurse advocates really are qualified practising nurses um, that are defined by a mode of practice which sort of deploys um, the A-Equip model. So this model um, is broken down as sort of advocating for education and quality improvement and it's made up of four distinct sort of functions really, um, normative, restorative, personal action for quality improvement and education and development and that continuous improvement combines restorative clinical supervision which we'll sort of come on to talk about later but I think the benefits of it and who can sort of um, practice are qualified nurses um, that are band five and above that have studied level six um, and above and I, th I think it's important to mention that it's also a big part of CPD so this role is a level seven master's um, level study. So it also involves a huge amount of clinical leadership um, encompassed within that. And I know Caroline's going to talk a little bit further about, you know, her thoughts around it. But I think it's really important to capture what Ruth was hoping with this role, which is by bringing together that leadership, um, you know, and helping PNAs on the programme with skills to facilitate restorative supervision to their colleagues and teams in nursing and beyond when they really, really need it. Thanks. I mean, that sounds like there's a it sounds like a big role, but it sounds like something that that has got so many elements to it. It has mm -hmm. real value, if you like, by by nurses for nurses. Yeah, I think it's um, you know, it's important, so important now because it's looking at cultures in within within teams that you know moving away from the the older roles of clinical supervision the restorative supervision is hugely important and focusing on that you know staff that may have may have um you know experienced moral injury moral distress 
you know, might have compassion fatigue. You know, the restorative supervision element of this role really puts the practitioner in the place of being able to bring that individual or bring that group forward to help them come to outcomes, come to um, you know, being able to to see the way out of some of this, um, you know, distress or trauma that they may be carrying with them um, and focusing on those four functions, actually looking at if within any of that there is room for education and quality improvement as well. And I guess what I basically what I really love about um, the restorative supervision is the fact that it gives ownership back to you as the practitioner for you to be able to think about what you can change within yourself and how what actions you need to take to be able to make those changes happen. Yeah, so you, I guess you're helping others to help themselves in that mm -hmm. sense. Absolutely. And, and, and given that I'm really excited by this now and I'm a registrant, so I suddenly want to become a PNA, how, what, what do I need to have to do that? You mentioned some of the things, Anthea, about kind of what level I need to be able to study at. But how, how would I go about doing that? Um, so I, th I think the team, the national team who have been and, and Dr. Emma Wadey and her team have been amazing in rolling this programme out during a, a really difficult time in the NHS. And I think the criterion for being a PNA and to, for going into that training programme sort of has to be set at a level. And again, sort of recognising that clinical nurse leadership and actually what the output of being a PNA means is actually being able to sort of, you know, operate and work at a level. So it's it's fairly straightforward. You have to be a registered nurse. Um, you have to be in a patient facing role, um, being band five and above. Um, and you have to hold a sort of pre-2012 nursing diploma, um, you know, with the addition of a top up accredited level six qualification so these are nurses that already perhaps hold an accredited level six qualification degree or degree equivalent top up level six cpd course and the only other thing is really that their line manager sort of approves them to be released and there are um universities up and down the country that are running this course um and those universities you know their assessment is different, you know, is differing, but they're working towards standards. The RCN are really pushing towards having a set standard for the PNA, so that you know, I suppose in in time it will standardise that assessment for all those that go on the course. And it is, you know, um, it, it's it's hugely beneficial. And I think through the cohorts that have already studied this at those, you know, universities, um, you know, they've broken ground really for those PNAs that are coming up behind them. Yeah, that's really helpful. I I suppose in, in, in much of the work that we see, and I guess in the media all the time, we, we see the pressures and the difficulty and how how you know how hard it is to to work uh, as a nurse under very difficult circumstances. How 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 can you operate this kind of model? I mean, it's clearly really, really important, but given those kind of constraints and the workforce issues and the challenges, how 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 do they operate? Because they must be operating from some of the things you've described. I think um, the most important thing is to be able to sell the, the benefit to the managers and to the practitioners themselves, because when people understand what they're going to gain from what you are offering, they will be able to actually accept it. Um, winter pressure is a pressure that we that comes every year. We know it. We always plan for it and we plan ahead with it. Um, Staff recruitment and retention or lack of retention, I should say, is something that is also ongoing and it's something that we, we put strategies in place to work to. So I think one of the issues that um, practitioners find in practice is the opportunity for them to be released by their manager to be able to go on to, to do the session. So what we do is to actually meet, you know, sell the benefits, talk to people about 
if you release your staff, if you allow them, it's just an hour session. And that one hour could actually save you a lot of money from sickness days and absences at work because being able to support them fully, um, offering restorative uh, supervision in a very safe environment and confidentiality is also maintained. Um, that in, in itself offers support and offers um, reassurance for the nurse and for the manager as well, because the manager doesn't have to deal with all of those issues. It's being passed on to the professional nurse, nursing advocate to be able to do that. Um, I lead as the professional nursing advocate in, in the trust where I work, and we have seen quite a number of situations. Also, one of the things that benefit that also come from this, which we sell to the managers and that usually encourage them to release staff is that it prevents burnt out and stress. Most nurses will, will talk to you about being stressed. Um, sometimes stress is not from the work they do alone. They are stressful because they, they experience stress because of situations at home. They experience um, stress because of situation concerning their friends, their family and things like that. And, and having that um, expert that experienced person to be able to talk to and be able to encourage and support you to actually work out what are the burning issue. What within your within your power can you control and what can you work towards resolving and what are the quality improvement actions within it? Looking at you know um, concepts such as the PDSA, the plan, do and study and act, looking at that and using the, those models to be able to support. There are so many tools within the professional nursing advocacy um, training that actually will support any situation. And for me, the most which I, it really, really gives me joy to say this, that nurses will be able to the nurses will be able to have better career development as well because in the in the past we find it difficult to talk to anyone about our career development you would think oh my god how do i talk to someone about it but actually you can talk to a pna about where you are at sometimes people are at a crossroad they don't know whether to turn left or right they're not sure what to do um, and having to talk to someone who actually understands and who can help you to unpick the issues that is confusing you, that is not enabling you to understand whether to turn left or right. That having to talk to someone about that will help. And mostly, because I've I've done quite a number of that, and on most occasions, or most of the nurses actually came back and they're thanking me for, you know, oh, thank you so much because now I've made a decision. This is what I'm going to do. And I've got I've got a job in that area. So it helps career progression and career development as well. I think um, Caroline's 100 percent right with this. And I think that what is so great about professional nurse advocacy and using the A-Equip model is that this model is a progressive model that's sort of inclusive of innovation and it, it allows individuals to bring a systematic approach to tackling complex problems. And actually, you know, when she listed all of the benefits of, of being a PNA and actually delivering some of that restorative supervision, you know, it's really pushing on the idea of this psychological safety within teams. You know, it's fostering that really supportive, no blame culture. Um, you know, it's allowing nurses as highly skilled practitioners to use that reflective practice to improve care. So not only to deal with issues that they might be bringing that have had impact on on themselves as individuals, but also impacts on services and patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then and that's really important as we move, you know, through winter through periods of recovery in the NHS. I think it's mm -hmm. it, and it's super important especially within our, our realm of community nursing, is that these individuals are reflecting on clinical practice, which is leading to enhancement and again can be used in, you know, QI projects, quality improvement projects. It can be used, um, you know, as part of revalidation. It can be used when coaching and mentoring students. So, I think Caroline's, as I said before, she's she's spot on, though, you know, that it has such, you know, long reaching impacts into yeah. our practice. 
Mm. And also, uh, Richard, I think one of the things also to mention is that we use data as, um, it, 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 you know, we present data to managers to encourage them um, to release staff. Um, and we've, we, you know, that has been reported that restorative supervision program support um, staff and it improves staff mental health um, and well-being and reduces burnt out um, by 43%. It's a, it was the research wow. that was carried out. It, you know, by 43%, um, restorative supervision reduced the burnt out and stress by 62%. That is huge, 62%, you know, from, um, and, and from six, you know, from very high, um, you know, from very, from 43.35 to 16.386 you know, from regional reports that have been supported. And I think for, that have been reported. I think for me, the most important thing is, having done this, I've not done any audit or any evaluation of what I've done as a PNA so far, uh, but should I audit that, I'm sure that positively I will realize a lot of dividends and I will realize also a lot of um, outcome because the man, um, the, most of the nurses that have been that have been through the process with us, they've come back and they've reported um, success, and they're actually thanking and sending appreciation emails and things like that. And for me, I strongly believe that um, restorative supervision it, it kind of allows that open discussion and gives that space for staff to be able to undertake reflective conversation and receive open feedback as well, which again is very objective and away from their practice area as well. I mean, that I'm, I'm so energised. I feel like <laughs> I've been taken on a journey um, to, to the promised land, really. But I, I think really, really helpful reflections and, and I suppose personal evaluations of uh, of the PNA process. I suppose I, I'm sitting here thinking this is really about the heart of nursing because it's about caring for other people, but in a purposeful manner that allows you to help people to look after themselves and, and progress, but you're there as that critical friend. So um, I, I'd like to thank you ever so much for the amazing enthusiasm you've brought to this um, and, and encourage people obviously to support and get on board with uh, the PNA and all the benefits that it brings. Could, could I quickly talk about the um, of benefits, of, benefit of QNA to the organization? Because I talk about the individual, um, the individual will feel supported, they experience less stress. I talked about that before. And they're really confident in dealing with any issues or the issues that they have. They, are, they don't feel isolated because they know they've got that support network around them. More importantly, they, they're more knowledgeable about the issues. And, and staff tend to understand their own breaking point when it, when mm. when they, you've had that conversation with them, they are able to actually identify their limit and they will then step back when they are burnt out or feeling stressed. But for the organization, um, having PNAs means that they are developing nursing practice and improving quality of patient care because if the nurse is well, then the patient will, will get better support from the nurse. Also, there is improved co communication between professional groups and pre professional and individuals, especially in terms of supervision and multi-professional working. More importantly, um, reduce turnover of sickness and absence because when we're supporting staff and their health and well-being is made paramount, then they are likely to come in and ab absences will be reduced. So I will encourage, um, I, I will encourage, we, we're supposed to have one PNA to 20 staff in every organization in the NHS. And at the moment, we haven't got that at all in any organization in nursing. And I want to encourage anyone listening to this to consider taking on the professional nursing advocacy role because it is a, it's a joy to be able to support each other and it's a joy to be able to give back to nurses because as nurses, we need to close rank and support ourselves and ensure that our health and well-being are made paramount because the, the chief nursing of England, the chief nursing officer of England is investing a lot into it. We need to accept that and invest our own time into it as well. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank and, you. And, and on that note, Caroline and Anthea, thank you ever so much for your contributions. Thank, thank you. you, Richard. Thank you.